Hello and welcome to Dragon Bites, the paediatric podcast aimed at paediatric trainees or anyone interested in child health. This week is one of our field reports from the recent St David's Day conference, which took place on the 27th of February. The conference happens every year around St David's Day. The conference is a collaboration of the Welsh Paediatric Society and the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health, with a different theme each year. This year, it was Child Health Promotion, with the broad aim to provide updates on the state of child health in the UK, as well as introduce current interventions and strategies in Wales. Apologies for the background noise, we did the interviews in the middle of the conference. If you weren't able to come, the background noise makes you feel like you're literally part of the conference. Hopefully, the field report will help you to catch up if you missed it, and to reminisce about the wonderful conference that it was if you came along. Over to Asim. Hi, so it's Asim here. Today's episode is part of a field report from the St. David's Day Conference. I'm sure Stacey's already gone through the ins and outs of what the conference is, so we'll just jump straight into the interviews. In fact, we've got so many interviews, we might as well call March the conference month because it'll take us three or four episodes just to get through them all. First up, we have Dr. David Tuttle, the president of the Welsh Paediatric Society. I caught up with him about halfway through the day. He gives a great overview of the conference up to that point, so that should hopefully give you all a flavour of what to expect over the next few weeks from the interviews. He also discusses the Welsh Paediatric Society, the Royal College and his work with the State of Child Health 2020 project. Right, so um, I'm Asim here and I'm here with um, Dr. David Tuttle, he's the um, Officer for Wales for the RCPCH and the President for the Welsh Paediatric Society. Hello, Dr. Tuttle. Hi, good afternoon. That's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> it's a lot to remember. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so I mean, who better to speak to about the whole purpose of today, um, the St. David's Day Conference? Fantastic. Well, thanks, Evan. We've had this St. David's Day uh, lecture for a couple of years now. I think it's really good to have a, a regional representation. We've had a variety of different great speakers today, ranging from sort of political um, representation of the Welsh Government, with uh, Frank Atherton, the Chief Medical Officer, giving his view. Then we looked at uh, college response and the determinants of the child health and how to advocate for them. We looked at the state of child health, which is our advocacy document that we produce every year, looking at what are the important health issues in children and what can we do about them. That's involved Rachel McKeon and Scott from the RS Colleges uh, group that interacts with young people and children to try and see what's important to them. Then following a bit of coffee, we had some fantastic talks from uh, Matthew Snape about the vaccination, the importance of that, and what's the role of the paediatrician in countering anti-vax campaigns, and some great websites to look at, including Vaccine Knowledge Project, which has got a really uh, excellent database and something you can direct families to. And then we had Max uh, Davis looking at screen time and the importance of just looking not so much at the number, but if that's affecting parents or families, if that's adversely affecting them being asleep or interacting with their lives or having interact with their families, then it's important to look at. And you've probably all seen um, people like uh, Michael Parkour as well, looking at these sleep projects and how fantastic of a talk he gives. And I was really touched, uh, as I'm doing you were there as well with Jennifer Evans and uh, Mercy, and how she talked about the importance of I guess the disclosure of Jennifer to her when she was younger about the HIV diagnosis she got and how she's been a fantastic, passionate advocate um, for healthcare for children and to avoid a stigma and you know, unwarranted retribution against people with HIV. I mean, that was a really warming conversation, not just in, in terms of the influence it's had on Mercy, but also the warmth of the relationship between Mercy and Jennifer yeah. Evans, which I thought was a fantastic yeah. example of that the lifelong impact a pediatrician yeah. can have. And, uh, her touched by her being invited to a wedding and um, a personal. Uh, I thought there was a tear in Jennifer's eye when I saw her uh, answering those questions. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, you, you very modestly um, not mentioned y- y- your own talk today, <laughs> which is really good um, on the state of child health 2020. Which is, I know, officially we're, everything's coming out next week. 
but you did give us a few highlights. Yes, I suppose we're trying to look at what, what's important to children and the fact that the college has widened its, um, I guess if I call it an umbrella of measurements, trying to look at what's happening to four nations that's personalised to England, uh, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales. So we can look at it across the um, four nations of the United Kingdom. What, what's happening in children's health? What are the issues of what's getting better? What may be concerning us? We've looked at vaccination, we've looked at uh, some of the sort of community violence, road traffic accidents. Also, some work on dental health, which I think is really something that we should be campaigning for as paediatricians. So, I think there's going to be some interesting things. Some bits are get, you know, getting better, other bits maybe have stalled. And I think you've probably seen in the media, not just about the RCBCH being quiet, but a lot of it's been happening over the last couple of days and couple of weeks. Or, I guess although there's progress in reduction in mortality, it seems to have stalled, and it's uh, quite different depending on your social class. Mm. I guess that's not a surprise to people, but how do we um, reduce that inequality? I don't think we'll ever eliminate it totally. I, I think that would be um, perhaps pie in the sky thing here, but if we can reduce the inequality, mm. I think that would be a fairer society. The effects of you know, social things, poverty, income, education, um, and the you know, head of house of empowering, I guess empowering women in education to make sure that they can make great choices for their family. Really important stuff, I think. It's been a running theme throughout today, I mm. feel, a lot of the public health determinants when it comes to child health. Mm. And I guess that shouldn't surprise us. I, mean, I come from a family, my dad's an engineer, and if we think, what were the biggest, I mean, if you were starting a healthcare system from zero, what would you do? You'd get safe water, sanitation and vaccination. Mm. And you probably put the vaccinations third or you after safe water and sanitation. Mm. So we've got to get our structures right. And yeah, don't get me wrong, healthcare is really important. I, I passionately believe it. Yeah. It's quite it's part of the it's a bigger picture though, isn't it? When we've looked at education's been uh, talked about today, how we empower people to make better healthcare choices, maybe giving sleep talks to um, students mm. in junior school and primary school so that they can know what to do. I think that's a fantastic idea to empower them as well to take that knowledge, cascade it down. Mm. I know it sometimes helps the Design to Smile project that Welsh Government's doing. Um, sometimes the knowledge has gone out through the children into the parents mm. and uh, things that they've been doing. Well, certainly it's been an eye opener for me. And not that I was entirely oblivious <laughs> of these issues before, I should defend myself slightly. But gen some, some of the statistics have been, you know, genuinely surprising. Yeah. Um, and but it's good to, I think there have been a lot of optimistic messages today yeah. as well, and I think that's been really helpful. But worst case scenarios seem to be that things have at worst perhaps stalled with a few mm. things, but not necessarily start to track backwards. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, I mean, I put one of the slides I put up, if you look at, like, say, go back 100, 120 years of life expectancy, it was 38. Now a child born today is probably going to be 80 years. So things have got better. There's always been inequalities. But I think maybe some of the progress you say has been stored. Smoking rates, fantastic. They're still on a downward spiral. And let's hope that continues and that other things, e.g. e-cigarettes, don't necessarily pick up just because smoking is going down. Mm. Okay, um, I thought we were also going to discuss a little bit about some things from uh, the RCPCH as well. Mm. <laughs> sure, but well, I guess um, something we'll ask a little bit about what's the difference between what Welsh Pediatric Centre and RCPCH. Mm. Our, ele our elected um, body is going to be the Royal College. That's the one we have uh, standards of education, and we have a, a Welsh committee that takes up uh, items from across Wales. It's got rep representatives from uh, South West, South East, and North Wales that can bring issues up, and that's our sort of elected body to raise things through a, um, a, govern, a governed way and a governance way, I suppose, up into the Royal College. The WPS um, is actually older than the Royal College, but was set up initially, I suppose, to produce, promote fr uh, friendship and fellowship and education amongst uh, Welsh paediatricians, and that, prior to RCPCH, I think, also had a role in uh, the organisation of paediatrics and mm. debates would happen about, you know, what changes should be made and you know, where should this uh, educational event be held or what are the ways we run paediatrics in Wales. But that's been subsumed now, obviously, by the college. Um, so it's, but I think the WS has got a fantastic role in promoting friendship, the training, and jointly doing the meetings through St Davis and WPS and RCPCH in Wales twice yearly. I think it's a fantastic way forward. It's got such a great heritage, the Welsh Paediatric Society. I think it's really important that we maintain it. Lovely. 
And, and how do we encourage tr trainees to get a bit more involved with the Welsh Paediatric Society? And what can I do to help my colleagues? <laughs> yes, sure. Get well, we've got, I suppose, in WPS, a couple of ways I really strongly encourage people to submit when we have our meetings. Submit some of your work. Mm. Um, to be an abstract. It's a great way in training you, you know, thinking processes to write an abstract and present it somewhere. So you get a training of that and a recognition of the work you've done in your, I mean, work you've done in your projects. In terms of if you're into sort of advocacy and representation, then the, ex or the executive committee of the RCPCH in Wales, we have junior representatives, trainee reps, um, and that could be a really good role to start doing that here. hear what's going on in Wales and how do we um, help, help take these college issues through. And also, you know, it feeds in then from a trainee representative into the college directly. So, you know, if there's issues about training or education, those can be heard at a higher level. Excellent. Thank you very much for your time, Dr. Tan. That was lovely. I'm sure you've got a lot more to do here still. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I'm looking forward to the practice tonight and uh, see how they go. But uh, I'm always excited by those and look at the trainees <coughs> and the support for them in Wales. Thanks ever so much. Cheers. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye. Next up, we have Dr. Frank Atherton, Chief Medical Officer for Wales. He gave a fantastic talk about the Welsh Government strategy on child health. This covered a whole range of topics and I got to explore one or two of the many things he discussed in a bit more depth with him. So hi, um, I'm Asim. I'm here with uh, Frank Atherton, Chief Medical Officer. Um, so we just, I was just in your talk now, uh, Dr Atherton. It was fantastic. Um, you covered a, a, a whole lot of things. I'm just going to mention a few of them for, the pe for people who couldn't attend. But, um, you know, policy work around child health in Wales, um, how we take a population-based approach, the Children's Right Charter on access to health care, the Youth Parliament, um, high child poverty rates in Wales, um, the influence on ma of maternity, time, on child health, child obesity rates, um, smoking, gambling, valproate, like there were there were a huge mm. number of things. Um, I thought it'd be nice just to maybe touch upon one or two of those things sure. for, yeah. for people who couldn't listen in. Um, so um, I think from a, so a public health perspective, I think in Wales we've got pretty high child health poverty rates. From a medical perspective, it's often hard for us to, mm. to see what we can do to help with, with something like that. And yet it's your it's part of your role in your capacity as chief medical officer to take all of this into account. So how do you filter in all of this information and then try and come up with strategies to tackle things like this? Yes, great question. So one of the, uh, the, the advantages that we have here in Wales is that we have a, a, a legal framework, the Wellbeing of Future Generations framework, mm. which helps us to, to frame child poverty and to think about the, the future generation in a very different way uh, and that means that um, questions of child poverty, questions of the determinants of health, questions about what lies behind ill health can all be addressed in a, in a very different way. Now that filters down, needs, needs to filter down from both the kind of policy work that we do in government uh, and the approaches that we take to improving people's lives, to uh, reducing income inequalities, uh, to tackling adverse childhood uh, experiences. Uh, all that it works at policy level, but it really is important that it joins up with the practical level of what happens at the front line. Mm. So everybody has a role to play in this. Um, it's not just a, a policy experience. Mm. It means that individual paediatricians, people supporting child health, have to think about the whole population that they see. They have to think about what lies behind the patient that they're seeing. Uh, and doctors are very good at this. I, I find particularly paediatricians very good at this. Paediatricians, geriatricians, uh, and general practitioners absolutely get that. They understand that uh, they're not just looking at a, a disease, a disease condition, but they're looking at the whole patient. And I think paediatrics and paediatricians have an enormous role to play in, in thinking about the determinants of health that lie behind the patient uh, that they see in front of them and in supporting them and signposting them and helping them to get the support and the access to resources and services that they need. Uh, and that's uh, one of the key messages that I was trying to give today.
Yeah, and, and if you mentioned a few of these um, policies and, and um, services that we can offer. So, so an example of that would be the Flying Start programme that we offer in a few areas. Um, and I, I liked what you said. So the Flying Start programme for people who aren't familiar with it, to help new parents from families who, who come from perhaps the more deprived areas of the country um, to access services that might help. Is that Have I got that sort of... Yeah, so, so the way I described it today was that we do have, uh, and it's a horrible term I know, but it's Michael Marmot, so we have to accept it, mm. proportionate universalism. So we do have core mm. services which are available to every family and every young person, mm. you know, through, a, through uh, the Healthy Child Programme here in Wales. But on top of that, and very much dovetailed with that, we have targeted support uh, to people in the most deprived communities. Mm. And we tend to target our support at communities rather than at individuals or at individual families uh, the reason for that is that if, if we do that which is a kind of an American approach we can often um, uh, really lead to stigmatization so so we provide additional support through health visitors through social workers uh, through additional resources uh, via the Flying Start program to the, the most deprived communities here in Wales and our ambition of course is to expand that and to provide uh, that on a wider geographical footprint but at the moment it's very targeted towards our most deprived communities. Oh, excellent, thank you very much. Is that alright? Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, I, I don't want to take up too much no. of your time because you've been great with us and you've, we've spoken about so there are so many things that we could speak about that I can't yeah. mm -hmm. even begin to fathom it all. Um, I, I did I did have a brief moment of pride there during where, we, where you mentioned that Wales was the first first country in the UK to yeah. appoint a, a, a child a commissioner for child children. commissioner for child yeah commissioner for children yeah, yeah. Commissioner, yeah exactly yeah. so that was a lovely um, yeah. thing. Uh, one thing that I, t I just take a personal interest in because it's something that I hear a lot about from from family more so than anything else and, and we might I don't think we've got to talk about this today but I think it's a really interesting new developing area is um, gambling in childhood which you mentioned briefly as well and uh, there's the influence of video games and the way that has now incorporated gambling Po uh, gambling tactics into children's lives. Is there any move at the moment from uh, that you're aware of from the government as to how we'd be a looking at tackling these sorts of problems in the long run? Yeah, it's in a really interesting area to shine a light on uh, mm. because there hadn't been a lot of work on gambling. When I produced my report back in 20, my annual report back in 2017. Um, people were asking me, well, why are you focusing on gambling? You know, shouldn't you be looking at smoking or alcohol or some of the other big ticket issues which affect people's lives? But um, I felt that gambling was a, an important issue to look at because uh, if we look at what's happened over the last 20 or so years since uh, liberalisation of the Gambling Act, we've seen an enormous increase in problem gambling, um, uh, we believe, and we've also seen a huge uh, uh, increase in advertising of uh, gambling by the gambling industry and although we mustn't confuse correlation with causation uh, the two do seem to go very much hand in hand so there seems to be something going on when we think about children and young people and gambling I mean the industry will say well we don't target young people and we are very careful about where we put the advertising but if you look at it uh, what football team, uh, what you know, doesn't have uh, uh, gambling sponsorship on its shirt? And of course, you know, kids see that and they uh, have very high degrees of brand recognition. So there is something about protecting children from the influence of. Uh, what what is not not a it's not a social evil. I mean, gambling isn't a, an inherently evil thing, of course not. But it, it it can cause harm, and so we do need to protect children from harm. The, the other dynamic here, which I don't think we've properly understood, and it's perhaps more of a research question, is the link between gaming and gambling. You know. What child in the modern era doesn't um, access gaming in some form um, through Xboxes, through consoles, through um, video games, etc.? Uh, they, they all do. Uh, and uh, what worries me is that some of the, um, the industry uh, created uh, models in there may predispose children to a, a gambling tendency. Um, you know, there are things like loot boxes and rewards in, uh, although they're non-monetary, 
Uh, they, there is a, a system of reward for gambling behaviour and I think we need to be very careful about that and understand what the implications of that are for the next generation. And again, our future generations act and our future generations thinking makes us uh, worry about the future and makes us perhaps more cautious about some of these. So it's an area I've been encouraging researchers to look at much more uh, and it's an area I think we need to do a lot more work on. Lovely. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Rath. Now, I don't want to take up any more of your time. It's been brilliant. Was there anything else that you wanted to say at this stage? Well, the only thing would be to say that it's been an absolute pleasure to come and talk with the uh, colleagues today in the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health. Uh, great to see everybody seeing so enthusiastic. Uh, uh, I, I always enjoy working with paediatricians in particular. I uh, did do quite a stint in paediatrics early in my career. Uh, and I vastly enjoyed it. It gave me a great grounding both for general practice and for public health. And I do see uh, the paediatric world, the general practice world and public health as needing to move in absolute harmony and work very closely together. So it's been an absolute delight to meet you and colleagues today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sasha. Finally, for today's episode, Stacey caught up with doctors Amy McNaughton and Kieran Humphreys, both public health consultants. Dr McNaughton is the lead for the 1000 First Days project and Dr Humphreys works for the wider Determinants of Health unit. They both discussed public health issues for children in Wales and went into a bit more detail with this with Stacey afterwards. Thank you for agreeing to have a little interview with me um, after your talk, which I really enjoyed and I learnt loads from. Um, so uh, this is Amy McNaughton and Kieran Humphreys from Public Health Wales. Um, so I just wanted to try and summarise, if possible, a couple of little points from your um, from your talk. Um, so you talked a lot about um, the wider determinants of health, didn't you? Um, and I just wondered if you could very briefly summarise um, some of the points that you mentioned about the wider determinants of health. So um, the wider determinants of health are a way of understanding the factors that really make a difference to good health. So stepping behind part of the diseases or behind things like the behaviours like smoking alcohol, but the drivers of those causes the causes, which are things like your money and resources, your education, your work, your housing. Um, and just our surroundings. And you talked, a bit, you talked about how it's quite complicated, isn't it? And, and we don't quite understand how each thing affects each other sometimes, do we? Um, so what, um, what are the main effects of poverty on health? Cause, um, so, I was, so I was really, really shocked, actually, from um, your talk. I mean, I, I, I knew that it did have an effect on health, but I didn't quite know the numbers and I didn't know quite how, how much it impacts. So what have you found in your so, so I guess some of the key statistics which I, I tried to draw out today were about the differences between areas of disadvantage, the, the most deprived fifth of Wales, to those less um, disadvantaged areas. And it starts at the very earliest point. So for example, for low birth weight, the chance of having a baby of low birth weight is 80% higher at the very first point in life. 10 days later for breastfeeding, if you're in the least deprived area, uh, only about 50% of, of babies are breastfed, but that drops right down to 25% for most deprived areas. It goes through to, through to uh, childhood obesity in school, and then even the ultimate price is death, where 70% of kids are more likely to die in childhood if they're from a disadvantaged area, and, and this just accumulates through the Yeah, lives. I was really shocked about that accumulation. Of, mm -hmm. um, it starts bad. And it just gets worse and worse and worse. Of course, it's not always like that. And I, I think this is where we have to emphasise that actually individuals can make a difference. Yeah. So one clinician in one family's life could make a big difference. Mm. We heard some nice examples today how that can happen. It's not all bad news. It does sound bad. Okay. But a getter. And I think the other, um, the other thing that's important to remember in that space is that conversation we've had this morning about the early years. And actually, if we invest early in the life course, we actually have the potential to change um, a child's trajectory um, through the rest of their life and improve outcomes right through to adulthood and that's why it's so key that we talk um, talk about um, how we can improve children's health right from the very early years. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was that was something you know that makes me really proud to be a paediatrician because you really really can make a difference to somebody's whole life by you know good care. Anyway I wanted to bring up one of the um, quotes that you uh, said in your talk which was lovely. If you change the beginning of the story you change the whole story. 
and that's by Rafi uh, Kabutian. Um, so we did say that sometimes it can feel like a bit like bad news hearing um, how bad it can be um, for some families um, in Wales. Um, so what can, what, what can we do as paediatricians every day um, to try and make a difference? Maybe a small difference or maybe a bigger difference? I suppose to start off it's worth just reflecting on those things that do have um, an impact on children's outcomes and the complexity of the way in which they interact with each other. So work we've done to date has kind of identified four um, key thematic areas where we can start to focus some attention and one of those is around specifically the health of the child um, and we know that children who are born prematurely or who um, have general poor health have um, issues in terms of longer term developmental outcomes as well, they can be at a disadvantage earlier in life. But actually a lot of the factors are outside of a child's immediate sphere of influence and control and it's important that we remember that there will be parental factors, so um, an individual parent's educational history or um, experiences in life will impact on their ability to provide a secure and nurturing home environment for a young child. Um, but then within that there are also some wider family circumstances and the way in which um, parents' relationships with each other and presence of conflict in the home can have an impact. Um, and also then right through to those wider determinants of health that Kieran's talked a lot about today and how housing insecurity, poverty um, will influence through a range of um, mechanisms the um, experiences children have in their lives and their long-term outcomes. Um, but in terms of what paediatricians specifically can do, I think um, if I hand over to Kieran, he can run through some of those suggestions that he covered in his talk. And in some way, they, they parallel the areas you've talked about, uh, Amy. So I think one of the things is, is the advocacy role. And I think the Royal College is, is of Pediatrics and Child Health takes a really active advocacy role. And obviously, paediatricians can get really involved in that on a professional level. But also, as active citizens, what is it you can do to make a difference? Uh, and that could be played out in, in all sorts of ways uh, uh, you know, if you want to address the, this level of unfairness. So that's kind of advocacy, but then we've also got a whole range of things that you can do in your day-to-day -day life. So thinking about the services, how it's set up, uh, lots of um, clinicians will be involved in um, you know, the design of services, the delivery of services, auditing those services, are we measuring who the impacts we're having on different social groups. Um, so, so really having that at the centre of your focus, reversing the universe care law which sees those um, with the most need for healthcare getting the, the, the least uh, quality often or the, the least amount. Um, then the, the kind of next, uh, next area is around the um, family and treating the whole family in the social circumstances they're at. We heard a great example from a pediatrician today who, saw, who was seeing a kid come back and back with uh, respiratory problems in a house that was completely inappropriate in terms of mould and damp, uh, awaiting social housing and not getting it. And what did they do? They wrote to the AM and they, they said they got a really uh, positive response to put them onto the caseload because you've got resources that that family don't have. So think imaginatively about what you can do for those families. Yeah, I love that. That's something I've not even really considered before. And actually yeah. it's a really good thing to do because um, you know, it's bringing it to their attention again and again and again and again and again so that they, you know, you have some evidence then, I suppose, don't you? Um, and, and I'm definitely going to consider doing it more. <laughs> health, housing, a lot of these things are actually devolved to Welsh Government. So sometimes we feel, what can we do in Wales? Actually, there's a lot we can do in Wales. There's a lot that's happened in Wales already. So housing quality has improved massively, uh, for uh, particularly um, social housing. But in private rented, we have a long way to go. So, um, you yeah, know, we've got challenges for place to go. And last is just dealing with uh, children so poor health is part of the cycle of poverty and if children who are living in poverty ca if you can help them in their health circumstances you can help them not fall into those cycles again and give them better opportunities throughout their life yeah sort of see them even though they've had sort of a bad start to life actually yeah. they're fresh too and they yeah, yeah. yeah. they have the whole life ahead of them that we can make it, hopefully make a big difference yeah, and, and one individual often can make a big difference in the life of, of a child yeah, or a family, just giving so. them all the opportunities and even perhaps more um, more than you would perhaps somebody else if exactly. you can because they need it more, don't they? Exactly, recognising that. It may, it may f sometimes um, 
we enjoy chatting to our peers and other professionals, uh, but actually recognising where the need is and giving our attention to that is what matters. Just trying to reverse that inverse Kayla. Exactly. Uh, thank you very much, both of you. Um, I really, really enjoyed your talk, and thank you for all the work that you're doing. <laughs> thank you very thank much. You. <laughs>